On this Tuesday night, major security gaps in Beijing's mandatory Olympics app. Anyone going to the Olympics is going to be spied upon. The warning from Canadian researchers to anyone attending the Games. A potential new threat in the air. This is reckless, it's dangerous, and it's got to stop. Fears 5G technology will put airlines on a perilous path. Alberta's justice minister dials up trouble. The phone call he made to Edmonton's police chief. And the addictive vocabulary game that's V-I-R-A-L. Very easy to get into. How millions are wild for Wordle. Global National with Donna Friesen. Reporting tonight, Sophie Louie. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin tonight with new concerns about the Beijing Olympics and Paralympics. With the opening ceremony just over two weeks away, the Chinese government is already racing to contain COVID-19 outbreaks and imposing measures to ensure the Games are not disrupted by the pandemic. That includes prohibiting foreign spectators. But for the international athletes and team members taking part in the Games, there's another concern, the safety of their personal information. Anyone attending the Games is required to download and use the My 2022 app. The University of Toronto's Citizen Lab looked into the security of the app and found some red flags. In our top story tonight, Eric Sorensen explains what's at risk. The motto for the 2022 Winter Olympics hosted by China is together for a shared future. But just what might be shared is raising alarms after a cybersecurity watchdog in Toronto found an app that China requires Olympic visitors to use has serious security flaws. China is concerned with the spread of COVID, so athletes and others must download the app to transmit health and travel data. My 2022 app was studied by Citizen Lab at the University of Toronto, which found it has a devastating flaw, where encryption, protecting users' voice audio and file transfers, can be trivially sidestepped, adding that an attacker can also display fake instructions to users. The concern is over everyday hackers and potential surveillance and censorship by the Chinese government. It showcases anyone going to the Olympics is going to be spied upon. The Chinese government is obsessed with controlling the narrative and is showcasing uh, a new form of digital authoritarianism. The app must be downloaded 14 days before leaving for the Games, which begin in 17 days. More than 150 Canadian athletes are scheduled to compete. <laughs> this Chinese promotional video calls for the world to reunite at the Games, but there is a diplomatic chill. Human rights groups want China stripped of the Games for alleged abuses of the Uyghurs and others. Canada has joined a small number of countries in a diplomatic boycott and will not send officials. A state media outlet for the Chinese government dismissed concerns about the app, writing, all personal information will be encrypted to ensure privacy. The International Olympic Committee says the My 2022 app is an important tool for health monitoring, that it's not compulsory to install on cell phones, and a third-party assessment found no critical vulnerabilities. This could just be, you know, sloppy software coding. Uh, I think uh, one should always uh, uh, sort of take the worst-case scenario. This is uh, very much um, the surveillance state one is dealing with uh, in China. One cybersecurity firm, Internet 2.0, suggests Olympic visitors bring so-called burner phones, disposable for use only in China. The Canadian Olympic Committee has already told its team members going to China to leave their personal devices at home. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. In the U.S., a last-minute decision by major cell phone companies may have averted a potentially catastrophic aviation crisis. New 5G cellular networks will be turned on at midnight tonight, but for now, not anywhere near airports. The concern is the new technology could interfere with aircraft systems. As Jackson Prosco reports, it's serious enough that Canadian officials have already taken steps to protect airports and aircraft here. 50, 40, 30. Radio altimeters are a key tool for pilots landing in bad weather, measuring distance to the runway. But their use in the sky is threatened by the introduction of new wireless 5G technology on the ground. You're going to have interference with a variety of, of airborne interests. Aviation is not the kind of industry where you try things and you see if they work. For months, airlines, aircraft manufacturers and the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration have warned 5G radio frequencies could interfere with critical aircraft instruments. 
That could lead to faulty readings, missed landings, or worse, a crash. 5G is now the biggest issue facing the airline industry, which is remarkable to say in a world where we're still in COVID. With U.S. wireless companies set to flip the switch and turn on 5G at midnight, the FAA ordered airlines to stop using altimeters at more than 80 U.S. airports, risking thousands of disrupted flights. Several overseas carriers have canceled service to the U.S. Late Tuesday, major U.S. telecom companies caved, agreeing to delay activating a small number of 5G towers near airports, though they insist there's no risk of interference. 5G just adds a much larger, uh, a more random, and, and frankly more disruptive layer of unreliability to what should be uh, safe and reliable commercial service. There's enough concern that Canadian officials have also taken notice. They've established exclusion zones around 26 airports. 5G antennas will not be allowed or they'll have to operate at lower power until more is known about the risks. Though 5G has successfully rolled out in nearly 40 countries, the U.S. has taken fewer precautions to protect the aviation industry. At a time when airlines are reeling from staffing shortages and weather delays, they warn without a long-term strategy, the introduction of high-speed wireless services risks slowing air travel for millions. Jackson Prosco, Global News, Arlington, Virginia. WestJet has announced a new round of flight cancellations. The airline says it's cutting 20% of its scheduled flights in February due to COVID-19 staffing shortages. The airline also says government restrictions are having a major impact on travel and are delaying the industry's recovery. WestJet canceled 15% of its flights in January. Tough new COVID-19 restrictions are coming to Prince Edward Island as the province deals with the growing spread of Omicron. As of midnight tonight, strict limits will be put in place on personal gatherings and no organized gatherings will be allowed. The province is also shutting down gyms and indoor dining at restaurants and schools will remain closed to in-person learning. We had hoped that the restrictions that we had in place uh, would be enough for us to slow things down, uh, uh, but uh, it does not seem to be uh, losing steam here. Even though we all want to be done with this, COVID is not done with us and we have to deal with that reality. In Quebec, new rules went into effect today for government-owned liquor and cannabis stores. Anyone who wants to enter must show proof of vaccination. Quebec's health minister says province-wide restrictions won't be relaxed until the hospital situation is under control. And some changes coming to restrictions in B.C. Starting Thursday, gyms can reopen with COVID safety plans in place. Other measures, including the closure of bars and nightclubs, will remain in place for now. Well, the cleanup continues after a winter storm slammed parts of Ontario and Quebec. In Toronto, it could take all week. More than 50 centimetres fell in some places, forcing the closure of major roads, stranding people on highways for hours, and delaying back-to-school plans for some students yet again. Jeff Semple has more on the winter blast and the deep dig-out. People across parts of Ontario and Quebec woke up to this. The calm after the storm. By Tuesday afternoon, some were still stuck, but things looked significantly better than just 24 hours earlier. From Windsor right up to Ottawa and up to Timmins, uh, uh, the, the, the province was uh, absolutely punished by this, this incredible snowfall. One of the heaviest, most intense snowstorms in recent memory, creating carnage on the roads. Two people were killed near Ottawa, including a tow truck driver struck by a snowplow. Another elderly man might have died too, if not for Clayton McGuire. The eight-year-old was watching the snowfall through his window when he spotted a man buried in snow. Then we put him on the front porch where our, we live. Then I got him hot chocolate and blankets. The family called 911. Paramedics credit Clayton for saving his life. So proud of him. If it wasn't for Clayton seeing him, who knows how long he would have been stuck there. After months of pandemic isolation, the snowstorm offered plenty of reminders of Canadian kindness. Even Ontario's Premier was out offering rides to stranded strangers, prompting a mixed response, with some noting Doug Ford wasn't wearing a mask and was doing live TV interviews while driving in a blizzard. Just trying to help him like everyone else is. It's just showing the, the, the Ontario spirit and... 
The city of Oshawa in Durham region, just east of Toronto, was hardest hit by yesterday's storm. Today, they're up to their eyeballs in snow after more than 50 centimeters fell yesterday. I'm trying to remember the last time I saw this much snow, especially in the city. The last time Toronto saw this much snow, you guessed it, back in 1999, when late Mayor Mel Lastman infamously called in the military. But this time, Torontonians are digging themselves out and even finding creative ways to get around. And for those keeping score, Toronto has received more snow this winter than most other Canadian cities. Jeff Semple, Global News, Toronto. Extreme cold and winter storm warnings have been issued across the prairies. Winnipeg is expecting a dangerous mix of fresh snow and winds gusting up to 80 kilometers an hour. Parts of Saskatchewan are being hit with blizzard conditions and extreme cold. And in south central Alberta, the snow may have tapered off, but icy temperatures have now moved in. With the wind chill, it feels like minus 25 in Calgary today. And beyond the snow and cold, Alberta is also dealing with a political storm over actions by the province's justice minister. Yesterday, it emerged that Casey Madu made a phone call to Edmonton's police chief after receiving a ticket for distracted driving. Madu has since been stripped of his duties while an investigation gets underway. Tom Vernon joins us now from Edmonton. Tom, walk us through what happened with that ticket. Sophia, it was last March that Casey Madu was pulled over in a school zone in a South Edmonton constituency. The officer told him that he had seen him using his phone. Now, Madu disputed this, saying his phone was in an inside pocket. However, he did end up paying the ticket in full. Now, after receiving the ticket, Madu admits he phoned the chief of police. At the time, he was dealing with a police surveillance scandal with the Lethbridge police, and he wanted to ensure the that he wasn't being unlawfully surveyed himself. He also wanted to raise concerns about racial profiling, both he and the Edmonton Police Service maintain he didn't ask for the ticket to be rescinded. Now, this has at least temporarily cost him his job. Premier Kenny took to Twitter to say Madu will step aside until an independent review can be completed. Political watchers say Madu should have known better. Either he was unaware that this was inappropriate behavior, which is bad for a justice minister to not know that they shouldn't be interfering in the judicial system like this, or he knew it and he simply didn't care. And that's even worse. Now, Tom, as you mentioned, the Premier says there will be an independent investigation into that phone call, but that's not good enough for everyone. Sophie, the opposition wants to know exactly who knew what and when. Caucus sources say rumours of the phone call and the ticket began circulating around the government as far back as the Calgary Stampede in July. The opposition is asking when the Premier knew about this ticket or when his office knew about this ticket. Sophie? All right, thanks for that. Tom Vernon in Edmonton. In Hamilton, Ontario, two paramedics will serve an 18-month sentence in the community for treating a teenager's wound as minor, even though he had been shot with a handgun. They were found guilty last year of failing to provide the necessaries of life to Yosef al Hasnawi. The 19-year-old was shot in December of 2017, but the paramedics said they thought he was injured by a pellet or BB gun. al Hasnawi died in hospital that night. Tonga cut off from the rest of the world. Coming up, why repairing a critical communications cable will prove difficult. A third death has been confirmed in Tonga after a powerful undersea volcanic eruption and tsunami over the weekend. As Mike Armstrong reports, we are now getting a better sense of the destruction from surveillance flights conducted by New Zealand and Australia. One of the things you don't see in the images of Friday's volcano is something that happened underwater. The communications cable that connected Tonga to the rest of the world was severed. These are the first images of the aftermath taken by a military aircraft out of New Zealand that had to make a round trip of more than 4,000 kilometers. They show shorelines battered by tsunami waves and just about everything covered in volcanic ash. The Australian Air Force had to make an even longer flight. It's releasing images that show damage to the port and the capital, damage to buildings, and the reason aircraft can't land, the runway at the main airport is covered in ash. 
The ash is proving quite problematic. The Speaker of the Tongan Parliament is in New Zealand. He says getting that airport reopened for aid is a priority. The latest information I have is that 60% of the runway has been cleared, um, and this is done manually. Um, I hear up to 200 volunteers are sweeping the runway. The Tongan government was able to issue a first update Tuesday on the situation. It does not appear to have been as devastating as was first feared. These are before and after satellite images. About 50 homes in the capital were destroyed, but some islands haven't been heard from. The government says communications were cut with the rest of the world, but also in Tonga itself, phones haven't been working. While ships in Australia are preparing aid, there are others preparing to make repairs to that underwater cable. It's not in deep water, but it's far, and it's in the volcanic area. The cable company says the safety of the repair vessel and the crew are a concern. Mike Armstrong, Global News. Hong Kong has ordered 2,000 small animals be put down after nearly a dozen hamsters became infected with COVID-19. The outbreak was traced back to a pet shop worker who tested positive Monday. Hong Kong will also stop the sale of hamsters and the import of small mammals. People who bought hamsters from the store after January 7th will now have to quarantine and hand over their pets to be euthanized. Hong Kong's health secretary says authorities are not ruling out transmission between animals and people. Ahead, Canada's new commitment to Ukraine as Russia's threat looms. The U.S. is sending Secretary of State Antony Blinken to Ukraine as Western governments warn Russia could launch an attack at any point. Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie is already meeting with top Ukrainian officials who are asking Canada for weapons to counter Russian artillery. Mike LeCouture reports. Russia's aggression near the Ukrainian border is now more than mere saber-rattling. Troops conducted tactical exercises southeast of Ukraine, while to the north, Russian tanks rolled into Belarus as those two nations prepared to rehearse repelling an external attack. With the threat surrounding Ukraine, its foreign minister has asked Canada for military equipment. We know that it is important uh, to play our part in the context, and therefore we are looking at options and we'll take a decision in a timely manner. Canada already has a rotation of about 200 armed forces members assisting and training Ukrainian troops as part of Operation Unifier. But it's clear the ask is about more capabilities, not more Canadians. Defense analysts point out we have plenty of rifles and radios in inventory, but there are other needs. Construction equipment, uh, engineering equipment, depending on the specific uh, supplies, the Ukrainians are looking to dig in a lot of fortifications. Um, so the, if we were willing to take something out of our own inventory, there'd be a lot of options. The Brits have supplied Ukraine with anti-tank weapons to be used defensively, while the U.S. is reportedly considering what it could send to help bolster Ukrainian troops against increasing Russian aggression. This is uh, an occasion when NATO really has to ante up its members have to ante up, and that includes financial assistance to Ukraine, it includes military assistance. It's military might, but also diplomatic determination. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is set to meet with Ukraine's president Wednesday before a face-to-face -face with Russia's foreign minister Friday in Geneva, a signal that perhaps de-escalation is still possible, even as Russian troops ramp up operations in the region. Mike LeCouture, Global News, Ottawa. What's the deal with all those green squares on Twitter? Next, explaining the Internet's wordle craze. Microsoft is upping its game by agreeing to buy troubled game maker Activision Blizzard in a staggering $68.7 billion deal. It would be Microsoft's largest takeover ever. The cash deal includes access to hugely popular games like Candy Crush and Call of Duty. Microsoft says it's hoping to boost competition in mobile gaming and virtual reality technology. But Activision is dealing with employees revolting over allegations of misconduct and unequal pay. If finalized, the takeover would make Microsoft the world's third largest gaming company by revenue. 
And tonight we are diving into a new online craze called Wordle, a free game taking the internet by storm. People are either obsessed or totally puzzled by it. If you don't already know the five letter game, you're probably asking, how do you play it? Well, I'll give you six chances to guess. As Mike Drolet explains, that's pretty much the gist. It's easy to spot a wordler in the wilds of social media. Just look for the green boxes brimming with pride. In many ways, Wordle is more of a craze than a simple game one disciple called addictive nonsense. Simpler, no. I, I think the only barrier is if you're not an English language speaker. A software engineer named Josh Wordle created Wordle last fall for his wife and friends. It's a web-based program which gives users six tries to guess a five-letter word. And there's only one word per day. Get it right, and you get to post those little green boxes for all to see. 100%. It, it is a brag. Um, it's, I think any type of puzzle, Wordle specifically, it's very easy to just say, look how well I am at this. I'm AKA must be smarter than you. In November, there were 90 people using it. Today, it's in the millions, in part because late night host Jimmy Fallon became so obsessed. App at and He spent 10 minutes one show trying to solve the puzzle. The appeal is in its simplicity. There are no ads. It takes under 10 minutes to complete. It's free, and the worldlers want to keep it that way. When another programmer tried to launch a copycat app, the backlash was so intense, Apple pulled the imitator from the App Store. But here's the thing. The idea isn't entirely new. Vol, V-O-L-E. Vol, V-O-L-E. There's a game show called Lingo, which is itself a copy of a game created over a century ago by Austrian philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein. But Wordlers should already know that because, you know, the best players are pretty much geniuses. Right, Sophie? Mike Trelay, Global News, Toronto. Very true. Thank you, Mike. That is Global National for this Tuesday night. I am Sophie Louie. Tonight's Your Canada is a view of Lake St. Louis from Point Claire, Quebec. There are beautiful spots all over Canada. Email your photos to viewers at globalnational.com. Thanks for watching and have a good night.